Good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to be with you guys again. Um, it's always so happy to see you guys' faces and uh, to bring God's word to you and pray that it does do something in your life. Um, so before we get started, I'll just pray one more time, um, and then we'll jump right in. All right, so let's pray. Dear God, um, please help us as we are listening to your word. Help us if there are any distractions that um, we can easily just set it aside and be attentive to what you might be saying to us. Um, and we know that it's easy to be swayed away in today's life, in today's world, but Lord, help us right now, um, and don't let my words hinder what you're trying to say um, to us right here. Pray all these things in your name. Amen. Um, so the title of my sermon, as you can see, is, Really, Paul? You've changed, bro. And it's because I couldn't think of a sermon title, but then I remembered uh, there's this Jeremy Lin video where... It's kind of a funny video where after he becomes an NBA player, he goes back home and his friends see that he lives his life really differently. There's this really one funny scene where after a four-game road trip, he comes to his friend's house and they're like playing Guitar Hero. And then his friends are like, hey man, where were you? And he says, sorry guys, I just got back from a four-game road trip. (laughs) This guy playing guitar, he's like, really? Is this a game to you? You changed, bro. (laughs) <laughs> and there's a lot of more funny scenes, but I thought it was just really funny because the guy playing Guitar Hero is criticizing an NBA player for his lifestyle. Um, and so you can watch the rest of the video if you go home. It's really funny. Um, but it's entertaining because the friends who've known him for all this time, they realize that he's changing. His habits are changing. His, uh, maybe his character is changing. The way he lives is changing. And I want to ask you, has anyone ever noticed about you? Maybe no one's ever said, hey, you changed, brother or sister. But I wonder if anyone has noticed that you being a Christian makes it a little bit different. I know it can be easy to hide the fact there that we're Christians at school or at after school activities. But I wonder, has that ever happened to you? That you lived in such a way that people noticed? That you lived a holy life desiring to honor God that it actually caused people to turn around and to notice you. And so that's what we're going to pick up today in the book of Acts. Um, you guys have been following this past uh, couple months, actually, in the book of Acts. And Paul is kind of caught in a similar situation where the people around him are saying, Paul, like, what happened to you? You've changed, bro. But actually, the, the situation here is a lot more extreme because... Uh, as you all know, Paul grew up a Jew, and so he grew up as a Pharisee. But now after he encountered Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road, now he's become a Jesus follower. He's going around and declaring the good news of the gospel. And this doesn't sit well with a lot of them. And so the chief priests, the Jewish leaders, they actually <laughs> want to put Paul in prison because they say, well, that's not the way our God works. Jesus can't be the Messiah. And so they actually succeed in um, getting Paul in prison. And Paul knows this. Uh, last week, if you guys are listening, um, Paul does something that is known as appealing to Caesar. So Paul right now um, was in a Jewish court, but he knew he wanted to get a fair trial. So he says, I appeal to Caesar. And I know that might be kind of abstract, but if you've watched Pirates of the Caribbean, the first one, in the first, I think, 20 minutes, if you guys remember Elizabeth Swanson, she's like in her house, the pirates invade, and as they're brought to end um, her life, she, what did she say? Yes, parley, parlay, if you want to sound more British. But what that does is it pauses the temporary jurisdiction, and she has temporary protection, and then she is delivered to a higher authority, which is Captain Barbosa. Uh, and so that's what Paul basically does. He doesn't say parlay, but he says, I appeal to Caesar. And what that does is it pauses the jurisdiction in the Jewish court, and he has temporary protection until he gets uh, a trial with Roman in, in Roman authorities. Um, and he knows as a Roman citizen, he has that right. Okay? And as we jump into today's story, I, I do want to give you guys like a rundown of the characters that we'll be um, encountering. So the first one is Paul. He's the one with his hands lifted up. And you guys know him. He's written most of the New Testament books. He's the one who, his name used to be known as Saul. But now his name is Paul. But I do want you guys to notice the people in the background. 
I don't know if you can, your faces are a little dim, but in this uh, Google image that I found, that's actually the Jewish leaders. So the Pharisees, the chief priests. Notice how their faces are really <laughs> angry and they don't like Paul. And so in today's story, these are the main players. Um, if you guys grew up in a household, if you have siblings, you know that siblings fight a lot. And so in this story, these are, in a, in a sense, the siblings. They're the ones in conflict. The Jewish leaders believe that Paul is a heretic. And Paul here is saying, I'm not doing anything wrong. And so those, those are the main players in today's, uh, today's story. Um, here's the next character, Festus. Not Azili, but Festus. Um, last week we learned that Festus, he's the ruler of the province. But here's the thing. He's only been in office for two weeks. Now, if any of you guys have ever been in any leadership positions, the first day is pretty scary. And the first week is scary. And you need help. And so Festus, he's a guy in charge. So if you think about the analogy, the siblings fight and the parents are the ones who decide the outcome. And you all know the younger sibling always gets away with everything. Um, but the parent here or the authority here is Festus. But he doesn't really, he's not as formed with the Jewish affairs, and so he needs help. And so he calls in the help of this guy, King Agrippa and Bernice. I know these aren't common Bible characters. They aren't people that you learn about growing up, but these are main characters. And they're the other uh, main characters that swing by, and Festus says, hey, I need your help. I don't really know what's going on with Jewish affairs. Um, can you help me out? <laughs> They're actually brothers and sisters, but here's a funny thing. They're actually lovers. Yeah, it's uh, really gross. Maybe that's why it looks like they're in pain. Um, <laughs> but they are in an incest relationship. And if you know that um, if this happened in today's world, like in the political arena, this would be the cause of a lot of drama, news articles, rumors. And so it was back then there that um, he was king, King Agrippa. But at the same time, people always talk about, wow, his sister is his lover. That's weird. And I think I would think it was weird, too. So that's the main character. But remember, he's the king. He knows what's going on with Jewish affairs. Um, so let's put all this together, okay? Um, so let's actually jump into your Bibles, into chapter 25, verse 13, and let's see what happens, okay? 25, verse 13. Here's what happens. Here's what it says. Now, when some days had passed, Agrippa the king and Bernice, remember they're the sibling lovers, they arrived in Caesarea, Caesarea and greeted Festus. He's the guy who's only been in office for two weeks. And they stayed there many days. Festus laid Paul's case before the king. And so um, it's kind of like when I grew up in junior high, high school, I was a handful for my mom. Um, and so my mom would often talk to other parents. Hey, how do I deal with this rascal in my household? Or she would talk to the pastor, hey, how do I deal with my son? And so that's basically what Festus is doing. He's talking to King Agrippa, hey, what should I do about this prisoner Paul? I don't know what to do with him. Okay, and so Agrippa says, yeah, sure, I'll help out. And so here's what happens next. Look with me at verse 23. Here's what it says. So on the next day, Agrippa and Bernice, they came with great pomp, and they entered the audience hall with the military tribunes and the prominent men of the city. So here's the full picture of everybody. So on the very left is Festus. Those two in the middle, let's see if this works. Agrippa and Bernice. This guy right here is Paul, and as you know, Jewish leaders. And so as we're putting this whole story together, um, you can imagine that the audience hall is filled with the rich, the powerful, people who have influence in the culture, and you, you can kind of imagine Paul being brought in. It was a very stark contrast. Uh, it doesn't really show it in the picture here. It's just an artist's rendition. But Paul's a prisoner at this time for the past two years. So he's probably in tattered robes. And he's ushered into the audience hall filled with wealthy people. Uh, I think last week Eugene made the uh, analogy. Think of like the congressional hearing um, where Democrats, Republicans, they come in and they hear uh, really rich and powerful people. Um, but here's Paul basically a prisoner, and he's giving a defense. And so Paul's speech, it's almost like a salvation testimony. 
Uh, recently, some of us here were baptized, and one thing you guys had to do was give your testimony to your youth group. I think Victor, Darren, and Lawrence gave theirs in Gap Sunday School. And it was basically, what was my life before Christ? What was my life after Christ? And it was a very warm and encouraging situation and environment, I hope. No one booed you. But Paul is in a very hostile environment. Look, everyone here doesn't trust him. They think he's a heretic. They don't believe what he has to say. So it's a very hostile environment for Paul here. And so Paul's testimony, essentially the way I broke it up, same thing. Paul shares about his life before Christ as a Pharisee, and then Paul shares about his life after Christ as a follower of Jesus. And so we're going to jump in and see what Paul has to say. And so the first one is when Paul shares about life as a Pharisee. Um, look with me at uh, this verse, which is verse, what is it? It's 26, 4 to 5. We're going to jump around a little bit, but his life as a Pharisee can be characterized as laboring under the law. And here's what it says. My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. I'm not sure if you guys know what it's like to live as a Pharisee, but it's a lot of rules. I mean, your parents give you rules, clean up the table, wash the dishes, but being a Pharisee, part of it has to do with keeping the Mosaic Law, you know, the Ten Commandments, but there's also a lot more. There's actually, putting all together, about 600 commands. That is a lot. And so, as a Pharisee, a Jewish leader, you have to keep those commandments. And it's a hard way to live, but that's what God commanded the Israelites to do um, in the Old Testament. Like, be set apart. Be a nation that is different from the surrounding nations. And so, the Jewish leaders here, the Pharisees, they're merely carrying it on. And so, what would it be like to live as a Pharisee? It would probably be very tiring. It would probably be... It probably seemed like someone's always constantly watching you. When you sin, you have to go this, through this cleansing process. And it's probably very weary, very burdensome. And so being a Pharisee, a lot of it, Paul is saying, is I was laboring under the law. And you might think to yourself, well, what does that really have to do with me? It's 2016. I'm a student. I'm an athlete. I'm a musician. I don't really know what it's like to be a Pharisee. And I want to ask you, are you, so, are you so sure? Because maybe you are a Christian. Maybe you have put your faith in Jesus Christ. But are there ways in which you act legalistically? Are there ways when you try to earn God's love and acceptance by following his commands? Could that be true in your life? If I were to ask you, what makes you a good Christian? What makes the perfect Christian? You might say things like reading the Bible every day. You might say things like praying before meals and outside of meals. You might say things like serving on a team, on a ministry team, going to church twice per week. You might say all these things and a number of things, Bible drill. But if that's all that you think Christianity is all about, if following Jesus is just about doing those things and that's the end goal of everything, then maybe we do act like Pharisees. Because the Christian life is not just about following rules. It's about knowing God and loving God, finding our joy in God. The end goal is not just to check off the list that I read my Bible today. Yes, God does command us to be in his word, but not just for the sake of reading and checking off on our list. So maybe there are ways in which we lose sight of God and we just focus on the rules. And so to live as a Pharisee, a lot of it is laboring under the law. We might feel burdened. And so this is what Paul is explaining. That as a Pharisee, a lot of it is just laboring under the law. And the next thing that he describes about being a Pharisee is that he was blinded by it. That the law actually blinded him. Look with me at verses 9 to 11. Here's what it says. I myself, Paul speaking, was convinced that I thought to do many things 
in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I do so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief of priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So for Paul, when all he did was follow rules, that actually blinded him. Now, I'm not saying biblical commands are wrong in any way. God put them in the Bible for a reason. But look at Paul. He was merely following the rules that was passed down by Moses, but he focused on it so much that he didn't even realize Jesus for who he was. That's kind of ironic if you think about it, that Paul, someone who is very well versed in the Old Testament, um, he knew the stories of Abraham, Moses, and he knew the God of Abraham of Moses, of David. But at the same time, he couldn't see Jesus for who he was. And he even ended up persecuting, killing Christians. That is an extreme. Like, how much more blind can you get by following the law? And so for some of you, have you ever been so focused on following the rules that you lose sight of everything? That, oh yeah, I'm not just supposed to pray, just so my parents are happy. I'm not just supposed to read my Bible just so my parents can leave me alone. It's supposed to be for the purpose of knowing God. I wonder if some of us have lost sight of that. With everything going around with school, activities, I wonder if some of us have lost sight that, oh yeah, going to church, it's not just so I can see my friends, though God has given us friends, but it's to worship God, to know Him more. And so, for Paul, he was also blinded by the law. Oops, did another one? So, let me see. Paul's blinded by the law, and here's what Jesus has to say. Turn with me to Luke 11.46. Luke 11.46. Same author by Luke, by the way. Luke wrote the book of Luke, and he wrote the book of Acts. Luke 11.46. This is what Jesus has to say about the Pharisees and for those of us who just follow the law legalistically. This is what he says, Luke eleven forty six. And Jesus said, and he said, Woe to you law, lawyers also, lawyers also, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourself do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. And so Jesus right here, I don't have time to go into all the context, but he is, basically calling the Pharisees hypocrites. That you burden other people with the law. You put so much pressure on other people to follow the commandments. But you yourselves aren't even perfect. And so for some of us here right now, sometimes we get so focused on following commandments, on following the rules, that we might become like Saul. We might become blind to who Jesus is. And we might think that Christianity... It's just about following rules. But it's more than that. Christianity is so much more than following rules. How do you know that? Because that's exactly what Paul shares next. And so, for the next point, life as a follower of Jesus. And that's characterized by being rescued by grace. Turn with me uh, back to Acts 26. And this is one that Kelly read for us uh, before I came up here. 26, verses 12 to 18. And this is when Paul is on his way to actually execute Christians on the road to Damascus. But then at the same time, Jesus encounters him. Now, this is really strange because as I was reading this, if I never read this story before and if I was hearing it for the first time and Paul's on his way to kill Christians and Jesus appears to him, I'd be thinking, yeah, all right, Jesus, let's see something here, okay? 
So Paul's basically a bully, and I have to deal with certain bullies in my life. And you know, if you see a bully at school, wow, you want to see something done to them. And so right now, I used to watch wrestling when I grew up. If I never read the story before, I'd be like, come on, Jesus, give him a choke slam. Choke slam him on the Damascus Road. Show Paul what he's messing with. That you are the rule of the universe, and you can end him right then and there. That's what I would want to see. Isn't that justice? <laughs> but Jesus does something very, very different. He doesn't RKO him. He doesn't choke slam him. He doesn't pull out any John Cena stuff. <laughs> this is what he says to him. Look with me. Uh, instead of condemning him, instead of doing, um, ending his life right there, look with me at verse 26. He says, uh, verse 16 to Paul, but rise. And stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose. To appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I'll appear to you. That's strange. God, why would you do that? He's the one who's been killing people who've been following you. Why would you rescue this person? If anyone deserves to have his life and it should be Paul, right? Or it should be Saul. But isn't this the grace of the gospel that God loves us while we are yet sinners? We might be confused that Jesus, why would you do that? Paul was a terrorist. He was a bully. He ended the life of many Christians. But God chose him, brought him from darkness to light, brought him from the power of Satan to God, and granted him forgiveness and sanctification. Let me ask you, you might have heard the phrase, God loves sinners, God forgives you. But do you struggle to accept God's free gift of grace and forgiveness? Here's an easy way to tell. Think about the last time you sinned. Think about the last time you did something wrong and you knew it was wrong. Maybe it was cursing at a friend, a parent, or someone you didn't like. Maybe it was borrowing answers for a homework or a test. Maybe it was looking at images on the internet that you know would cause you to lust. Think about that time when you know you did, you know you did something wrong. Right afterwards, what do you think in your mind? How did you feel in that moment? Do you believe God loves you in that moment? When you realize that you did something wrong, how do you react? Guys, I know what it's like to drown in the sin of my shame. I know what it's like to feel that God doesn't love me. That when I sin, how could God ever love someone like me? And so for some of you right now, do you accept God's free gift of grace? Do the facts in your head that Jesus loves you, does that enter into your heart when you accept that Jesus has forgiven you? That's the real question. Anyone can say Jesus loves you. But the real question is, in your heart, do you trust that Jesus loves you? That he has forgiven you if he says that? And so I hope that we don't fall into temptation that, God, if I just obey you, then you'll love me. If I follow this commandment, then you'll love me. Right, God? Look at what I did. There is an error in that thinking because you are anchoring God's love in your own action. You're Anchoring God's forgiveness and your ability to obey him. That's a pretty small God. That's not a really powerful God if he is swayed by your sin. And so I want us to consider if God's love really is infinite, never changing, what would that look like in my life? And so here's the truth that God does love you while you are still a sinner, Romans 5.8. Do we believe that, though? I'll turn you guys to a verse, Romans 8. Romans 8. This is one of my favorite verses in Romans. Here's what it says. Right, I'll wait a couple of seconds for you guys to get there. When Paul declares that he has been rescued by grace, he is saying that the gift of grace is so much sweeter, so much more liberating than what it is to labor under the law. 
Paul, who actually wrote Romans, here's what he says in Romans 8, 1 to 4. It says this, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. I think that's what Paul realized. That the person, the name of Jesus that I'm trying to execute in his believers, this is the person who saved me from my sins. That if he did die for my sins, there is no more condemnation. And for us believers right now, what part of that word don't we understand? It says it right here, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus, God says that there is no more shame for your sin. There is no more condemnation. You will not go to hell for your sin. My son bore that on the cross. Jesus took the wrath. He took the shame. So we don't have to. So when you think that maybe you're despicable, that when you're unworthy of God's love, you know what you're really saying? You're saying that Jesus really isn't enough for me. You're saying, God, show me more. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, that wasn't enough. I need more evidence that you do love me. And that's an insult to God. Jesus is enough. Will we embrace it? Will you trust that to be true? And so, the central truth of today is that the law exposes your weakness, but grace covers your sin. Now, it might not explicitly, explicitly say that in the passage of Acts, but that's what Paul is basically saying when he's describing his life as a Pharisee and what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. That the law is only meant to show us how broken we are. So you see, the law isn't a bad thing. When you think of the Pharisees, when you think of the Jewish leaders, don't think of them as, wow, those are the villains of the story. Yeah, they are sinners. They might not be saved. But they're keeping the law of Moses. They're doing what they think is best. The thing is, they're so blinded by it that they couldn't see Jesus Christ or who he was. And so, right now as we kind of go into the application, um, I want to give some word pictures. I want you to think of the law as a mirror. Now, there are so many facets of what the law is, so I'm not going to say everything about the law is a mirror, but I want you to know that the law is a mirror. In Romans 7, 7, I'll read it for you guys. Here's what it says. What shall we say then? That the law is sin, meaning that it's evil. Paul says, by no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet. If the law had not said, you shall not covet. So, for example, if there are no rules in school, if there are no rules at home, it'd be chaos. But the law is a gift from God to show us, this is who I am. This is my character. This, or this is God's character. Now, this, this is how I want you to live. And so, when you read a command in the Bible, know that, wow, this is the character of God. God says, do not murder. God says, do not lust after another man or woman. God says, do not steal, because this is who God is. And I should desire to be like that. And so, see the law as a mirror. Here's a second word picture. That you cannot out God's grace. Yeah, we're pretty rotten. I messed up. I'm standing up here. I'm preaching the word of God. But you guys don't really know me. You don't know the thoughts I've had. You don't know the sins I struggle with. I'm no better than you guys. I'm really not. I'm just a sinner saved by God's grace. And as twisted and as deep as my sin is, there is no way it can out God's grace. And so I put a picture of a mountain here because if you guys have ever been at home and knocked over a cup of milk, you have to clean it up. And it's really easy. You wave your hand around, oh shoot, my milk spilled over. And it's very easy. And even this podium right here, it's pretty, if I just put a little strength in it, it can topple over. And I think sometimes when we sin, 
we think we have canceled out God's grace. We think we might have caused God to be so fed up with us that he can never forgive us. And imagine how crazy it would be if you saw me in Yosemite or Joshua Tree, and I'm trying to push over a mountain. I'm just pushing into the side of the mountain. And you're asking me, hey, Kevin, what are you doing? I'm trying to push it over. And you probably say, you idiot. Because that's stupid. Why would someone try to push her over a mountain? There's no point. I could be doing that probably for a million years and nothing would really happen. It's a mountain. It's just there. It stays there. So for me, I like word pictures. It anchors my mind and expands my view of God. And so when I think of God's grace like a mountain, something that can't be toppled, something that cannot be undone by my sin, it expands my view of God. Now here's a funny thing, because most illustrations fail, because if God is infinite, then this picture of a mountain, that actually might be an insult to him. Because God says, really? I'm bigger than a mountain. You're comparing a mountain to you being able to out my my grace? And so... Even as I'm showing this picture, even when it does expand our view of grace, know that God is infinite. That this picture doesn't do justice, but it is helpful. And so, I hope those word pictures help. Um, some application um, is for some of us here today who are still struggling. That maybe your parents drag you here. Maybe you don't even want to be here. <laughs> You're just waiting for lunch to go home and watch what's on Netflix or something like that. But I really want to ask you, have you ever in your life accepted God's grace, trusted his forgiveness? Because what happened to Paul, this radical transformation, it could happen to you. This story 2,000 years ago is a story that could happen in your life right now. The same spirit and power that change Paul's life, it could dwell in you. God could change you with that same power. So I want to ask you, have you accepted that? Second one is, biblical commands are the means to enjoy God. They're not end goals. Don't just think of Christianity as a set of rules. That's not what it is. These rules, they're like a doorway that help us know God more. When I pray, it's not just to thank God for my food and to not really know who it is, it's to enjoy God, to share my struggles with Him, to be in an intimate relationship with Him, with the God of the universe. So the fault of the Pharisees, which might be the fault of us, is that we might just think Christianity is a set of rules, when it's so much more than that. Guys, it really is. Third one is, rest in the full forgiveness of God. I'm actually really surprised that when Jesus encountered Paul and said, hey, I want you to be a missionary and be a witness to me in this town, this town, and these areas. I'm surprised that Paul said, okay, I'll do it. I'm surprised Paul didn't say, wait, really? Why would you choose me? And I think it's because God, Paul, he knew he was a sinner. He knew he was nothing. There's nothing in his life that could earn God's forgiveness and love. That it has to be given to him. And so, for you guys today, I hope that we trust in God's forgiveness. That when the Christian life seems heavy and burdensome, consider that that does happen. The Christian life is hard. That you should expect suffering in one way or another. If it hasn't come yet, it will sooner or later. But if your burden is stemming from the fact that you think Christianity has a set of rules, that's not what it's all about. And our story and narrative today show that Paul experienced that love and forgiveness. He experienced that truth. And so I hope and pray that you all here do too. Let me pray for us right now. Father God, We need you. Whether we are a Christian or whether we are still struggling with this Christianity thing or maybe we just outright don't believe. 
each and every one of us, no matter in what life stage we're in, we need you. God, sometimes our mind ventures into legalism and we think that what we do impacts who you are and changes and maybe cancels out your love. God, remind us that your love is infinite. You love us the same before we were Christians and you love us the same even now. So Lord, work in our hearts. In your name, amen.